Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the latest edition of the Neonatal Human Dynamics Foundation's curriculum. Uh, it's another absolutely exciting speaker uh, for our seminar series today. Um, a couple of words of housekeeping. Welcome to all of our new trainees um, and prospective trainees. This reminder to everyone that trainees are going to be are joining us as panelists. Um, and we also give a warm welcome to everyone joining us as a seminar attendee. A reminder for everyone to please put your questions in the Q&A box. And I'm going to be moderating the discussion uh, after the talk. Feel free to put them in throughout the presentation um, so that uh, we can keep track of them and line them up for afterward. Um, I did want to uh, note that there is going to be a, a QR code posted up on the screen at the conclusion of the presentation uh, so that you can undertake an evaluation. And we greatly appreciate you taking a couple of minutes out of your day to, uh, to fill out that evaluation. I'm pleased to acknowledge the support that we get from Malincrod Pharmaceuticals, the Nino the Hemodynamics and TNE slash NPE Foundations curriculum is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Malincrod Pharmaceuticals. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today. Dr. Philip Levy uh, is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and a neonatologist at Boston Children's Hospital. His patient oriented and translational research initiatives focus on cardiac mechanics and congenital and acquired cardiopulmonary diseases. His research is a part of a larger international collaborative that was established to examine emerging measures of cardiac function, pulmonary hemodynamics, and large preterm birth cohorts to define physiological and pathological patterns of postnatal cardiac adaptation. Uh, I think you're going to love this talk today. He's speaking on uh, cardiovascular management of neonates undergoing therapeutic hypothermia because of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic talk, and he's a fantastic speaker. And Dr. Levy, I'd love, uh, it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I think if you stop sharing, then I can share my screen. Um, and it's uh, it's really just great to be with everybody today. Um, just a thumbs up if you can see the screen, Danny. Awesome. Um, I, I really just appreciate I know there are people from around the world that are here. And um, I know people are taking time out of their busy morning, evening, afternoon. I know there's a lot of holidays coming up. I celebrate Passover, but I know Easter's coming up and just really appreciative to be here with everybody today. I, I don't have any disclosures. This lecture, um, as Danny mentioned, is actually the second part of a series of lectures on hemodynamics and neonatal encephalopathy or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And I I put my own QR code up, but um, you can probably find this with websites from, from Danny and Danielle, but Reagan Geisinger, uh, close colleague, gave the first part of this talk. And I'm going to be really focusing, as Danny mentioned, on, on the cardiovascular management. There will be uh, poll questions throughout um, this uh, talk, and please feel free to put uh, questions in the appropriate areas where Danny mentioned. So I'm going to start off with a case. Um, as you can see also throughout my talks to keep everybody awake, wherever you are in the world, I put bitmojis. Uh, so this is me sitting at the, at the office of the, of the transport uh, service that we run here at Boston Children's. And I, I got a call from one of our level two NICUs out in our community. Got to hear about a story of a term infant born about an hour ago at 41 weeks in respiratory distress. And the referring hospital had, had already made the decision to do passive cooling for concerns of neonatal encephalopathy. The baby that they told me was born C-section, a 24-year-old gravid one mother. She had gestational diabetes, unremarkable prenatal labs. And there was a non-reassuring fetal heart tones, which they said was a sentinel event. And that was the indication for C-section. So just going along, as I started to ask questions, they told me that the baby emerged limped and apneic, was, was cyanotic, did have a good heart rate, saturations were 70% in five minutes, was getting some PPV, stuff that I think everybody on this call is familiar with in a delivery room. 
Apgar's were two, five, and five. UBC and the UAC were placed, and the baby was sent to the NICU. And as expected, the baby was LGA, large for gestational age of four kilos. And up on the screen are some of the initial vitals, and, and we'll review this throughout the talk several times, but really can see that there was some evidence of low blood pressure. There was pre and post ductal saturations that, that, that were splitting. Our initial lab valuation in, indicated some um, metabolic and a little respiratory acidosis, base SS negative 14, a lactate of three. And on physical exam, as you, you can imagine, the baby was pale, asynchronous breathing patterns, and had cool extremities. So, so the question I have, you know, for everybody just to start off with is, you know, what, what's going on? And just to summarize, you know, you have a term, infant of a diabetic mother, large for gestational age, non-reassuring fetal heart tones, significant delivery room resuscitation, evolving acidosis, and, and, now, and now the baby's intubated. So here's the problem list, kind of the way I think about it. And this is the way we're going to kind of walk through the talk today is, you have hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with therapeutic hypothermia. You have a low blood pressure and probably a low cardiac output state, not to be confused with or or the same. There is acute or persistent pulmonary hypertension physiology. Again, people use different terms. That's a talk for another time. An infant of a diabetic mother. So I think we have our first poll question, which Laura will put up on the screen. So what is the most likely cause of heart failure in this neonate? So just for everybody, I, I see there's 92 different participants. Um, just choose one and then we'll, uh, we'll get to our answers. Give everybody about a few, few seconds. Great. Um, okay. So People chose hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy overwhelmingly, but people did choose infant of a diabetic mother, potential infection. Nobody chose arrhythmia. Nobody chose metabolic, and nobody chose congenital heart disease. Great. So, basically, when I when I think of heart failure, you know, people really just try and jump into HIE and cooling and try and understand it. I, I want to get at the basics. Now, I think many people on this call understand that the function of the heart is to fill with and then eject blood properly to its different target organs. So the right side to the pulmonary system and the left side to the systemic circulation. It's really, you know, how much blood is coming in or the preload, what's the resistance to get the blood out, the afterload, and what's kind of that ability to squeeze the heart or the contractility. And this is the determinants of function. So when we think of heart failure or cardiomyopathy, I think about it in terms of congenital heart disease, and this is clearly not the case versus structurally normal heart. And taking it one step farther, when we talk about neonatal cardiomyopathy, it's really just a group of diseases that has different both morphological and functional phenotypes that can affect essentially the heart muscle. And as I mentioned, alter cardiac performance at or soon after birth. So I think it's really important to understand the etiologies and the way I think about it, again, this is structurally normal heart. I think, is there going to be a cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular impact? And these, these impacts that I'm talking about, again, as all of you alluded to nicely in the answers, there could be infectious, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. There could be fetal volume overload for those centers that care for AVMs and vein of Galen's, twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. There could be the arrhythmias the autoimmune diseases. So that's where the infants of diabetic mothers and then of course, drug induced. I also think about it in terms of pathophysiology. So it goes beyond just understanding the etiology, but what's, what's the pathophysiology mechanisms that's being impacted? There could be genetic acquired or mixed. This is not genetic in this case. You can have early or acute or chronic or late. And then, of course, I think it's important to understand, are you dealing with an impact on the right heart or the left heart? And for me, when I, when I think about this, I think most people will recognize when you have left heart disease and right heart disease with the following etiologies of what I call chronic or late cardiomyopathy. So the ductus, chronic pulmonary hypertension, prematurity, infection, and sepsis. But what I'm trying to allude everybody to is what's happening in that early transitional period. So again, there's another way to, to 
classify what I just mentioned, sepsis, HIE, fetal anemias, arrhythmias, infants of diabetic mothers, and then that, 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 that disease, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. What about the phenotypes? I'm going to mention these over and over again so people start to understand this. You could have a normal kind of right and left ventricle, but then you could have hypertrophic, so you have very thick walls and a thin cavity where my pointer is, or you can have dilated cardiomyopathy, which is a very thick, uh, a wide cavity, but very thin walls. There are some other mentions of phenotypes that I won't go into now. I want people to really focus on the hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies. And this is where it's important. The phenotype meets etiology. So if you are using advanced hemodynamics, both your clinical examination and potentially echocardiography, you can understand that the phenotype that I mentioned could give you insight, insight into the etiology. So for example, with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, with a perinatal insult, there could be a dilated cardiomyopathy. Again, a lot of cavity, very thin walls. But if it's infant of a diabetic mother, you could have very hypertrophic walls and a very thin cavity. So again, this is what I call phenotype meets etiology. So the, the questions I want to answer in the next kind of 45, 50 minutes is what's the impact of HIE on therapeutic and cardiovascular performance? How good are we at monitoring our hemodynamic status undergoing an infant's undergoing therapeutic hypothermia? And what are our, what I call cardiovascular management strategies? And should they be based on the physiology and the pathophysiology disturbances? So I, I think most people will we'll know the next several slides, but it's important to understand that there's some insult leads to hypoxia, ischemia that causes brain injury. Within minutes, there's immediate necrotic cell death and an abnormal outcome. And then there's that reperfusion injury, which is delayed or apoptotic cell death occurring six to 72 hours. And I think all of us would agree that there's just really no good way when the baby comes into our hands to prevent the minutes, the, the, the primary insult, but thera therapeutic hypothermia has a goal of reducing the metabolic demand to promote recovery and kind of prevent this delayed insult from the sentinel event. And, and again, I don't really need to go into much depth, but many different trials, you know, the seven randomized control trials had over a thousand neonates were cooled to 33 to 34 degrees. And I would say, over the last 15 years, this has become the standard care in developed nations and consistent benefit of therapeutic hypothermia for patients with that moderate to severe encephalopathy. Here are my three dilemmas. And again, I, I will give kind of a shout out. A lot of these dilemmas, a lot of these thoughts come from uh, both Reagan's initial lectures and some of the work by my good colleague, Afif al Kufash in Dublin is, 40% of neonates either die or are left with neurocognitive sequelae despite the optimal applications of therapeutic hypothermia. And reducing the core temperatures will not only preserve kind of that metabolic impact and, and, and help with long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes, but it will actually alter the function and the physiology of all the organs to varying degrees. And then my third dilemma, and there'll be a series of questions I'll ask you all, is that we know that hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can affect the brain and the gut and the liver and the bone marrow and the kidneys. And in fact, I, I think these are the things that we check most frequently, but many centers around the world, we, we don't really even think about the cardiovascular system and the impact that it will also have on the heart. We often wait till there's a change in blood pressure or heart rate and in my humble opinion, you've waited too long if you're not thinking about the heart. So second question, did, uh, Laura's gonna put this on the screen as I read it, but is echocardiography a standard of care on all patients with HIE undergoing therapeutic hypothermia in your center? So yes, no, or sometimes. And I'm curious to see the different answers that we have, we'll give it another 10 seconds for people to answer and Laura's gonna put it on the screen. So yeah, a third, a third, a third, that's usually what I, what I like to see. So yes, 
33% no, 44%. So there are more no's than there are than there are yeses. So interestingly enough, uh, Reagan led a group uh, of, of researchers who did uh, um, a nice um, uh, kind of uh, study with surveys and found that 62% of the centers of 114 that were polled, you know, um, um, trying to really understand, you know, who gets and who doesn't get an echocardiogram routinely found that 41% do not routinely request echocardiogram. So really in line with what we said, we said 44%. It was a little higher if you include the sometimes, but this really gives us insight to where the state of the field is today. A another study that came out uh, about a, a year ago uh, from uh, Alay Neary, who, who trained with the group in Toronto, and Nim Subdahar, who's done some great work, also found kind of similar situations, but they were looking more at kind of specific cardiovascular management guidelines and, and found that only about 40% had these guidelines. And then you can see the breakdown of how many of the centers had t &E echo capability, always, usually, sometimes, or rare. So really laying out what the problem is. So, so here's, the, here's the next question that we'll put up on the screen as I read the question. But if the neonate with HIE was hypotensive, what would be your center's first line approach to management? Would you would you give a normal saline bolus? Would you add an inotrope? Would you just start prostaglandins? Would you get an echocardiogram or would you change the ventilator, for example? So again, what is your, you know, you, you don't have necessarily all the resources at all the major centers, but I'm curious to see what people would put here. Give it another five seconds, good. So normal saline bolus, trying to think about preload, an inotrope, trying to think about contractility. Nobody wrote start prostins. Porter wrote obtain an echocardiogram. So basically, again, looking at kind of the surveys that were done out there here, just some bit emojis. Um, so the role of neonatal hemodynamics. So basically, we'll, we'll take the case that I started and followed a little bit longer because it's not just an easy answer. Um, that we put up on the screen. So the, the infant's now eight hours of age, 41 weeks, LGA, IDM, HIE, undergoing therapeutic hypothermia. So here are all the pertinent facts that we see. So the baby's now on high-frequency oscillation, uh, a mean airway pressure of 16. The chest x-ray is well-recruited. Actually, the, the diaphragms were flat. Now the FI2 is one. On Somebody added nitric, 20 parts per million. The preductal sats are 88%, postductal 78. You got weak pulses. You can see the blood pressures there, 34 over 29, both systolic and diastolic. The labs show worsening metabolic uh, acidosis, a high lactate. You know, this is not my center, but another center started the baby on dopamine and titrated all the way up to 20 mics. You knew you had a normal fetal echo. So, so what would you do specifically if the blood pressure was due to just critically low pulmonary blood flow. We could put up the, the question on the screen and severe acute pulmonary hypertension. So this is assuming that that the, the, the cardiac function is okay. So what would we do? Would we give a normal saline bolus, adjust the inotrope? What would be the first thing you should do? I should really put that there. Start prostins, obtain an echocardiogram, or try and reduce the mean airway pressure. Do another three seconds, two seconds, one second. So again, just trying to understand the physiology. So yeah, so giving a normal saline bolus would adjust the preload. It could be helpful. Adjust the inotrope. That's definitely a, a, a good approach. You'd probably want to wean the dopamine. It may be too high. We'll talk about that. Start prostins. Well, th that's not necessarily the first thing I would do. An echocardiogram may or may not be helpful, and then reduce the mean airway pressure. So actually, in this situation, what, what, what you actually might want to do initially is try and reduce the mean airway pressure. You may actually be squeezing the heart and not allowing it to have a full fill effect, no pun intended, or have full contractility because the lungs are so dilated on either side of the heart. Trying to transition off the dopamine would be helpful. Um, uh, as was alluded to, because the dopamine is very high and the properties of impacting 
you know, your SVR and your contractility are now also being outweighed by some of the impact on PVR, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So let, let's go to the next question. So what would you do if the blood pressure was actually due to RV or LV dysfunction and there was only moderate or acute pulmonary hypertension? So again, would you give a normal saline bolus for preload? Would you adjust the inotrope? Would you start prostaglandins? Would you obtain an echocardiogram or would you reduce the mean airway pressure? So again, this is an HIE baby, uh, evidence of physiological pulmonary hypertension, and you have troubles now with cardiac function, which you can figure out sometimes with the blood pressure. So let's let's put some answers up there. A lot of you said adjust the inotrope, which is which is correct. Start prostins, obtain an echo. And again, nobody wanted to give a bolus and nobody wanted to really reduce the mean airway pressure. So in this case, you have low systolic blood pressure and poor SAT. So really the treatment, as you all alluded to, was really to adjust the inotropic support. Again, you want to help with the contractility. Dopamine has probably lost its effect. And I'm going to take this home in a few slides to show you that. And then prostaglandins would be indicated if your PDA was restrictive or you just felt that the right ventricle did not have the um, for lack of a better word, to drive the blood through the pulmonary vasculature to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, and needed that PDA in order to support the systemic circulation. And one good marker of this is if you just see a rise in your lactate and a worsening of your metabolic acidosis would be indicative, also along with the physical exam, that you're in a low cardiac output state, which is, again, different than having low blood pressure. Let's go to the next question. Remember, this is an infant of a diabetic mother. So if you had septal hypertrophy and acute pulmonary hypertension, what, what would you do? So would you give a normal saline bolus? Would you adjust the inotropes? Would you start prostins, obtain an echocardiogram, or reduce the mean airway pressure? Again, this is a situation where the septum is hypertrophied in that kind of left ventricle um, and, and may actually be preventing outflow, um, which then would potentially affect which one? Afterload, preload, or contractility? And we could put the answers on the board. And again, correctly, people said, adjust the inotrope seems to always be the right answer when you're on a dopamine of 20. I wouldn't start prostins. That wouldn't be what I'd want to do. But giving a normal saline bolus actually may be, may be appropriate because you're not able to kind of fill the heart because of the septal hypertrophy. Again, reducing the mean airway pressure on the ventilator is always a good answer when you're on a high map. And then trying to remove the inotropy is actually probably the best. You don't want to end up with a heart rate of 180 because again, no pun intended, you won't be able to fill the heart. So here are some pictures that Reagan had lent me. So again, here you have impact or impaired LV filling. So the treatment is to decrease the mean airway pressure. You have severe RV dysfunction and the treatment would be trying to optimize an inotrope if you weren't on an inotrope or trying to adjust your inotropes. And then finally, if you have severe septal hypertrophy, which you can see clearly marked here is volume of vasopressor and trying to remove all of the inotropic support. So again, this really helps you understand how hemodynamics plays into the management. You don't necessarily need an echocardiogram. It's very helpful, but you can actually use a combination of your clinical exam, your physical exam, your blood pressures, which I'll get into in a few minutes. So here was the next question that Reagan and Elaine had, had posed in their different studies. What is an abnormal blood pressure? I think we have there. So is it a mean arterial blood pressure less than gestational age, a mean arterial blood pressure less than 30, systemic or diastolic blood pressures less than the third percentile, or end organ dysfunction? How, how would we play into that? So give it another minute. Okay, so it seems... A lot of people picked, you know, it seems like we've been paying attention to the lectures. 50% of you picked that systolic or diastolic blood pressure, which is great. And here's just another way to frame it. Um, the many kind of nice lectures on this, and I'll, and I'll touch upon it just very, very briefly. But in this study that, that Reagan had conducted, it was fascinating. Of 71 academic centers, 17 different definitions of hypotension. 
And fascinating to me is that cardiac output was actually only reported in 20% of the center. So triggers and therapies, uh, Elaine's group took it a little bit further and said beyond just figuring out what determines a low blood pressure, they looked in these patients with HIE, what would be your first line choice of medications and your second line choices? And you can clearly see if I had asked everybody these questions without having all the hemodynamic information, we'd probably get dopamine and dopamine and fluid boluses just like we listed. So the point of this is that without a consistent kind of way to measure blood pressure and trying to use it as a surrogate as cardiac output, we're going to get different responses with triggers and therapies. And I think it goes back to the basics. And, and I know a lot of people are familiar with this, but I always love to put this on here. You know, to determine cellular metabolism and homeostasis, it's not just about blood pressure. It's not we have a problem. And, and you can't just use an algorithm. Thankfully, Patrick has shared these slides with many of us. It goes way beyond this. It looks at the relationship between cardiac output, between the blood oxygen delivery and consumption, and the target organ. So the relationship between the heart, the right side, and the pulmonary vasculature and pulmonary hypertension, and the left side, and the systemic circulation and the brain in HIE. And in order to have kind of a happy heart, again, it's really understanding that the determinants of cardiac output is what comes into the heart, the preload, what goes out of the heart, the resistance, the afterload, and how the heart squeezes or the contractility. And of course, there's a balance with heart rate and morphological changes. And as I mentioned, this paradigm holds well with HIE. We initially thought it was only the left side, but now we've learned that it's also the right side that impacts cerebral autoregulation. And I'll speak about that in a few minutes. The question though, for me has always been, can blood pressure just alone tell us everything we wanna know about cardiac output, blood oxygen delivery and consumption and cerebral autoregulation? And I, I can tell you that the answer is no, but the way to think about it is this. So if you have decreased cardiac output, the question is, will blood pressure and cardiac output match? So in this case, if you're decreased your cardiac output and you have an inadequate, inadequate way to compensate for that, so both your cardiac output and your SVR are low, you're going to be hypotensive. What if your SVR is low? And I gave examples there. So an example of a hemodynamically significant PDA, if you can't compensate your cardiac output, so you know your contractility fails for some reason, you'll be hypotensive. But you could have states where your normal tensive with one of them is high and one of them is low. So let's look at an example. Decreased cardiac output, so your hypovolemic, cardiac dysfunction, but you can adequately increase your SVR. Well, you're going to be normal tensive. And finally, if you have a decreased SVR, but you can adequately compensate with your cardiac output, you'll be normal tensive. And with HIE, this is the take home highlighted in yellow. If you have increased SVR, because you have an insult on your SVR with acidosis that vasoconstricts, but you have a drop in your cardiac output because the function, the, the ability for the heart to squeeze is impaired, then you're still going to be normotensive. And we can initially see this in the initial phases, and that could be a problem because it could give you a sense that everything is colbacetic or kosher, for lack of a better word, but truthfully, it's not. And it gets even more complicated because all of this ties into cerebral hemodynamics and oxygen balance. And this slide is meant to give you a reference. It's a great article written by Petra Lemmers and, and their group, but really to understand that arterial blood pressure is a significant component of cerebral oxygen balance and autoregulation. So the heart and the brain are working together on this front. So here's question nine. What are the pathological contributors to cardiopulmonary dysfunction? Is it a primary RV, LV, or acute pulmonary hypertension, or is it a secondary RV, LV, or acute pulmonary hypertension? Give it a few seconds, let people answer that. This is a really tough question, and I want people to think about this as they answer. What, what's going on? Why is the heart sick with these babies? 
Give it another few seconds. And then we'll put uh, Laura's monitor. Great. So ooh, it seems like we, we, we got a lot of different answers. The majority of you said secondary RV dysfunction. So the truthful answer is all of the above play into different pieces of the puzzle. So let me walk you through this. So again, some of these caricatures come from my good friend Afif al Kufash, and I've modified them to show these points. So you have an initial insult and you have brain injury. You also will have hypoxia or ischemia in the heart. There can be both a primary and secondary impact on the LV. There could be a primary and secondary impact on the RV afterload. And there could be a primary and secondary impact on RV dysfunction. So if the primary insult is gonna be on the RV afterload, there's a secondary impact on RV function. If the primary insult is on the LV function, well, there could be a kind of post-capillary pulmonary hypertension physiology with diastolic dysfunction and a secondary impact on the RV afterload. There could be a primary impact on the systemic vasculature, which will raise the SVR and then cause a secondary impact on LV dysfunction. So there are ways to mix and match all of these. So what happens? Eventually, you get in the state of decreased cardiac output physiologically and clinically, a lot of us see pulmonary hypertension in some of these babies, which can lead to cerebral autoregulation by that slide I showed on the previous um, uh, page. So we use therapeutic hypothermia in order to mitigate or limit the secondary impact on the brain. But when you cool a baby, you actually will increase the afterload you will decrease the preload and you will lead to a drop in the heart rate. So that's not good. That None of those three things that I've put up on the screen can be helpful in any way, shape or form to that heart. So the treatment and the therapy to preserve the brain function long-term actually can be detrimental to the heart. And it's imperative that we sort of look at all of these different mechanisms. So before we can really jump into this, if anybody's heard me talk, I always like to go back to the basics. And I think it's important to understand that this is a unique overlay. This disease is a unique overlay between the pulmonary disease, pulmonary vascular disease, and cardiac disease. And I, I love embryology and I love history. So I think most of you understand airway development from the embryonic stage all the way to the alveolar stage. But it's fascinating to me that the cardiac development precedes airway development. And the vascular development actually arises from a temporal and spatially controlled process. So the take home message here is that if your lungs are affected and your heart is affected, your vasculature is also going to be affected. And any insult to one area can lead to an insult in another area. And when I think about cardiomyocyte structure, again, this is barred from my good friend Afif, Basically, what I want people to understand is the mechanism. So here we have these L-type channels. It brings calcium into the cells and then allows for active release. The calcium induces calcium release from outside to inside. And we know that calcium will then help with contractility. And finally, all of this gets facilitated through the L-type channels and the transverse tubules. So if you've never seen this before, the take-home message is what's highlighted in yellow. Calcium channels and transverse tubules. In a neonate, in a premature neonate, and especially in a neonate undergoing some type of insult, they will have less L-type channels and less transverse tubules. They cannot bring the calciums into the cell. They cannot facilitate contractility to the same extent that other healthy individuals can. And that's the take-home message. This will come back into play when we talk about therapeutics in a few minutes. What about loading conditions? We know, based on a lot of good data, both animal and evolving human data, that as you go up on your preload and put more blood in that left ventricle, based on the Frank Starling curve, you're going to promote your stroke volume. But an immature heart or a heart that has an insult onto it can't initiate the stroke volume to the same extent. So you can see that right away. Now with afterload, 
using force frequency relationships as you go up on your afterload, you are going to augment your stroke volume to an extent, but an immature heart can't do it to the same extent. And a right ventricle does it even worse than a left ventricle. So the take home point here is that there are altered loading conditions based on the physiology, gestational age, and different disease mechanisms. And therapeutic hypothermia and eventually rewarming also modify these loading conditions. So it's fascinating that both the treatment and the way to get out of the treatment can alter how the heart responds to what's coming in, how much we can get out, and how the heart can squeeze. And we've learned also over time from nice animal studies that the younger you're born and the more exposure you have to different disease states, that you have a decreased ability for the heart to contract, which promotes diastolic dysfunction. So you can see on figure A, there's a higher collagen to total protein ratio based on gestation. So preterm infants' hearts are about 80% non-contractile. And then from animal studies, term lamb compared to preterm lambs have much less inflammation, again, leading to the fact that we know that these preterm hearts and these hearts under stress have a decreased ability to contract. And when you put it all together, for me, with the physiology, it really goes back to coupling. How does the right heart or the left heart respond to increases in afterload? So afterload on the x-axis, performance on the y-axis. As you access your reserve, you get a peak function, and eventually you fail. And when you tie it back into the phenotypes and the etiologies, you can see under normal loading conditions, RV function is maintained. But as afterload goes up, the RV is met with hypertrophy initially, so dilating those free walls and a small cavity. But as the RV afterload goes up and up and up, the RV function can no longer handle the stress of the afterload. The RV will uncouple from the afterload. You'll end up really dilated with a thin wall and you end up failing. Now with metabolism, this is a really interesting feature and this is, explains why in the delivery room, some babies do really well in that golden minute when they're completely hypoxic. It's because neonates, they're able to tolerate acidosis. They have less oxygen consumption and therefore can tolerate hypoxia much better than a child or an adult. And the classic um, NICE study that was done by Shahab Nouri almost 10 years ago had function and contractility on the y-axis in figure A and B and compared it across different pHs from 7 to 7.5 and found no difference in function or contractility, really highlighting this important fact that neonates can tolerate acidosis and hypoxia. And finally, this background, which I think is really important, is that at birth, the parasympathetic system is fully formed, but that alpha-1 and beta-1 systems are not fully formed. So really what we're seeing over time is that if you're born earlier or you have any insults, you are prone to high vascular tone. You have decreased alpha-1 and beta-1s and this reduced net inotropic effect. So how does this play into this? So the case that I gave was of a baby who got dopamine. The take-home point is I don't try and have people memorize all of this, but understand that there's different receptors for each one of these different medications. And if you give a medication and you get to a point where you don't see an effect, well, it's possible that the receptors are not working the way you want because of the parasympathetic and sympathetic developments that I just showed on that previous slide. So this really matches the physiology to what we're doing clinically. There will be a QR code for this slide towards the end. So putting this all together so everybody understands, where are we right now? This comes from a great paper, um, and, and, and I borrowed the slide from, from a fief. So we have the insult, you could have myocardial ischemia, you can have a primary, both on the right and the left ventricle. You can have a primary insult on increased PVR. You can have a primary insult on increased SVR. You also reduce the preload because you have fluid restriction, capillary permeability, you have a lot of blood sampling. I know groups um, 
across the country, specifically at WashU and St. Louis, have done a really nice job at trying to limit the blood sampling on these babies, impaired contractility. So this will be a direct impact on the myocardial ischemia. You could have altered inotropic response, as I just showed you with the differences in the parasympathetic and sympathetic systems. You can have lower heart rate, which will lead to slower repolarization, makes it harder to manage cardiac output and stroke volume. And then all of this can lead to a very negative impact on the brain. So kind of putting this together, the question becomes with question 10, I'll go back as Laura puts it up on the screen, is what are the different modalities that you can use to assess cardiac performance in infants with HIE. Now, I, I put one already up on the screen there. NIRS, NICOM, which is non-invasive cardiac output monitoring, echocardiography, clinical exam, or biomarker. So this is the point where everybody kind of wakes up in the lecture and gives me what, what would they, what would you use? What, what might be your first line? We, we can frame it that way. And we can see what some people kind of put up on the screen for us. So 10% would use NIRS, 2% NICOM, overwhelming would go to echocardiography, clinical exam, and biomarker. So I actually might argue that first line would probably be echocardiography, clinical exam, and biomarkers, but here is just kind of a list of the different possibilities that we can use. Some um, are clinically related, like echo, some live in a research state like NICOM, but are evolving. EEG, obviously, if you're you're that wasn't a choice there, MRI, NIRS, clinical exams, vital signs, and biomarkers. So I put this potpourri because I think there's no standardization, but these are the modalities that are used at different centers. So what was fascinating back to the study that Reagan kind of designed with the survey is that, you know, I mentioned cardiac output only being reported about 20%. Now, while ejection fraction was most commonly reported about 83% of the time in the survey, only qualitative assessment of RV function is reported in 57%. And I'm going to show in a few moments how quantitative RV function can actually be very sensitive and specific on examples of cases from Iowa and Toronto. Toronto. So, when I think of the assessment of cardiac mechanics with echocardiography, I love this figure that Afif gave me. And what you can see here, this is just the left ventricle. And, and the three ways I think about doing this in two dimensions, looking at it from the largest in diastole to the smallest, this kind of change in cavity dimension. So ejection fraction on the left or fracture area of change on the right. So another way to do this is to kind of look at a single movement of a point from baseline during diastole to, oop, did it stop? There we go, to a new movement in end systole. So that's where we have TAPSI, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, or MAPSI, and then tissue Doppler imaging. And then some of the newer novel technologies, which we've worked on over the last 10 years to bring into neonatology is really the baseline shape in diastole to a new shape in systole. And this is deformation or strain imaging where you can have strain, kind of normal strain along the longitudinal circumferential or radial. And then you can have what I call kind of the shear strain, which is the circumferential longitudinal pattern, which is torsion. So these are just some examples and I'm gonna use these measures as I highlight some recent research from kind of the Toronto, Dublin, Iowa group. So again, change in dimension. I know a lot of people have seen this already. So we're looking at LV ejection fraction and RV fractural area of change. The basic concept is you're going from an end diastole to end systole and looking at the change in the measure. Tissue Doppler, I put up here Eric Nestas, if any of you have ever worked with him. He did some of the original research using tissue Doppler imaging to look at both systolic and diastolic properties back in 2009 and 11 with HIE. And then a change in a single point here, again, looking at TAPSI, the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. You could do it either using M-mode 
or you can use the four chamber views. And then finally, strain imaging or deformation, which is fantastic. It can give you insight into both loading conditions and then some novel work that's been done looking at strain rate, which is really a good reflection on contractility based on the forced frequency relationship. And finally, torsion, how the heart twists and turns. This is that shear strain that I mentioned. So looking at it in the circumferential and longitudinal patterns really focused on the left ventricle. I'm not gonna go into depth, but I really always feel it's important to understand how NICOM or non-invasive cardiac monitor can be helpful. People have used this in research setting. Danny has used it in other centers, really looking at bioimpedance, a change in amplitude, and bioreactants, a change in phase shift, and happy to answer questions related to this offline. But it really gives us insight into stroke volume, heart rate, and cardiac output. It may not give us specific numbers, but people have used the trends that these uh, um, NICOM devices give us to look at its impact on physiology. And I put just up a nice recent article um, highlighting NICOM with a systematic qualitative review. What about strain imaging? I talked about that. Eric did some nice novel work that we highlighted in one of our papers. But the long story short is that individuals had initially shown that when compared to healthy, non-asphyxiated neonates, those asphyxiated neonates, both in cooling situations and in non-cooling situations, had differences in their strain measurements, which gives you insight into the function of both the left, in this case, and right ventricle, which I'll show you in work from Reagan's group. This is uh, some work from a fief looking at the rotational mechanics, looking at torsion, and really looking at kind of three different groups, term HIE and term controls. We won't look at the preterms right now. And he was able to show that there were significant differences in the normal or longitudinal strain. There were significant differences in the torsion between the term and the HIE patients, and really highlighting that the functional properties of the left ventricle based on his work were different in babies with HIE. This data, again, from a FIFS group, looks really at using um, NICOM monitoring, which again, I won't go into much depth on them, but really looking at outcomes, choosing an abnormal versus normal MRI, looking at LVO, looking at cerebral regional saturations and finding different outcomes and different patterns during the cooling and the rewarming phases. Again, looking at stroke volume and how it's not correlating directly with mean blood pressure, which is an important take-home point. And then also looking at heart rate and also looking at SVR. And the, the, the teaching had always been that cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate in the babies, it's really kind of heart rate depending, but some newer work from a, a FIFS group has actually shown that at least in the late preterm infants, there are times when there is more of an impact as it relates to stroke volume. So again, trying to understand how the physiology goes beyond just a simple blood pressure to give you insight into how the heart is trying to eject blood and fill and work against all of the different factors that are impacting its ability to do those functions. So what are the merits of screening? Here we could put the next question up on the screen. This is a question that Reagan had proposed to her group. Infant board at 40 weeks, emergent C-section, APGARs are horrible, CPR. Would you screen an asymptomatic neonate? So that's the question. And by screening, would you get an echocardiogram? Yes, always, no, never, or maybe. Maybe if the blood pressure was off or the heart rate was off. So I'd like to see what people put up for their answers here and then walk you through. So again, maybe 50%, yes, always 40%, and no, 9%. So, so what she showed with this example, and here's just heart rates, what I would expect it, blood pressure is what I would expect it, minimal vent settings, met criteria for HIE and undergoing therapeutic hypothermia. But the case that, 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 that she presents here is that 
when she went and looked at the echocardiogram, despite all everything else looking okay, you can clearly see here the, the heart's not moving that well. Actually, both the left and the right ventricle don't look healthy, kind of rocking back and forth, poor ejection fraction, poor cardiac output, LV strain. Again, these numbers may not mean much to people, but it should be in the negative 17 to negative 20 range. The higher the magnitude, the better. This is negative 3.4. That's poor. And then using kind of um, uh, measures of the right ventricle, there's only mild kind of RV dysfunction using TAPSI as a, as a point measure and fracture area of change as a measure in, in, in the changing the cavities. So the next few slides are gonna really highlight the work that Reagan and Patrick and Afif and Danny have really done trying to unmask the impact of HIE on the right ventricle. I would say, and I would argue until about 2018, the general teaching was that HIE can lead to pulmonary hypertension and can maybe have an impact on the left ventricle. We never really thought there was a primary impact on the right ventricle. And what their groups did, a really well prospectively designed study where the primary outcome was based on rewarming, on MRI after rewarming, really short-term outcomes. Um, they compared echocardiograms between kind of infants who fit in the adverse versus the normal outcomes. And then at kind of three time phases, like therapeutic hypothermia time one, therapeutic hypothermia time two, and then the rewarming phase. And, and, and the take on point is that there were significant differences highlighted here between measures of RV function, not just qualitative measures. We're talking about measures that are quantitative, that have been validated. We know what the normal patterns are in neonates all the way down to preterm infants, but looking at TAPSI, fracture of change, and strain. So looking at a measure of change in cavity, change in point dimension, and change in kind of the deformation of the shape. And here, this is just, if you, if you like the visualization, it makes it more clear. TAPSI was higher, fracture area of change was higher in the normal group compared to the adverse group. And then using our classic area under the curve, you know, if you have a TAPSI less than six and an RV fracture area of change less than 0.29, it had a very high sensitivity and specificity to uh, reveal the primary outcome. Now, in a similar study that was done more retrospectively and had other issues going on, led by Gabriel Atlit and Krissa Van Muir's, you can clearly see that they found similar results in the sense that there was abnormal RV and LV function. And it's really important to understand that when you have a nice prospective study done by Reagan in Iowa, that these results could be recreated as was, as was done by the group uh, up in Canada and at Stanford. So the most fascinating piece of this story is not what they found in the short term, but how what they did right at birth with pooling and rewarming correlated with outcomes at 18 months. So they looked at primary outcomes, cerebral palsy, Bailey three scoring, and they showed that TAPSI at 24 hours of age was actually predictive of the 18 month developmental outcome. So that's a really impactful message that the right ventricle actually plays a huge role in these outcomes cardiac output, cerebral autoregulation, all of these different features where we're now trying to learn more about this. So what about the pulmonary hypertension? Really fascinating to me, you know, this comes from work from Satyan, when is at Buffalo, now at U, uh, uh, C. Davis. We know that pulmonary hypertension is commonly found among infants with moderate or severe HIE. And truthfully, the prevalence is actually close to about 22% in this study that he did. So the question here, we'll put this question up, um, is was pulmonary hypertension, is it due to the initial HIE insult? Is it due to the cooling? Is it due to the insult on the PVR? Or is it due to the insult on the right ventricle? Um, I don't know if there's actually, oh, there's the question. It's actually question 13. Thank you, Laura. So what's the cause of acute pulmonary hypertension? I want people to just think about this. Is it the initial insult? Is it the cooling? Is it the insult from the right ventricle dysfunction, or is it the insult from the LV dysfunction, which can cause an impact on that right ventricle or kind of cause what I call that post-capillary pulmonary hypertension? Let's see what people choose. 
So the answers are, again, the, the true answer is it's all of the above. Uh, primary is probably the initial insult from the HIE, but I want to show you how it can be from a little bit of everything. So here's a case, again, um, borrowed from Reagan's group. You have at initial echocardiogram, babies on 35%, therapeutic hypothermia is initiated, babies at 35.8, they were passively cooling. Five hours, they're all the way down to 33.1, but the baby's now on 100%. And your follow-up echocardiogram really shows almost all right to left. So what's going on? And, and work that's been done, which I'll show some highlights from, is basically for every one degree that you go down in temperature, your PVR can go up by about one to 2%. And, and I think the next slide, yes, had some nice work from the Iowa group that was presented at PAS last year looking at normal thermia and therapeutic hypothermia, really looking at the impact that the cooling has on the pulmonary hemodynamics and using a measure of systolic eccentricity index, which is a nice quantitative measure of looking at septal kind of flattening, looking at PVRI using the RV systolic time outflow track measures, and then the dot notch PA Doppler. You can really see that as you go from normal thermia to therapeutic hypothermia, you have a worsening of your pulmonary hemodynamics, but a preserved kind of impact on your RV performance. So there is some unique thing that's also happening while you're cooling the babies. And I, I like to think of neonatal pulmonary hypertension in three domains. I think about it with elevated mean pulmonary pressure, but it's an impact on your PVR you can have impact on your pulmonary blood flow, not so much in HIE, and then you can have left heart disease or increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure if the LV is sick. So let me show you some examples. So when we think of pulmonary hypertension, you think of a maldeveloped pulmonary vasculature, a maladaptive pulmonary vasculature, and then the impact on the pulmonary venous congestion. And, and again, just going through these a little bit quickly, you can see that with maladaptive pulmonary vasculature and your PVR is high, there could be a pulmonary insult, right? Or there could be a non-pulmonary insult. And that's where HIE comes into play. With the pulmonary venous congestion, it's, it's not really pulmonary blood flow, but if you have left heart disease, that can severely impact your pulmonary venous congestion or the post-capillary. So there's multiple ways to impact early neonatal pulmonary hypertension. What's highlighted in, in, in work that was done uh, by a fief in, in collaboration with our group is really looking at diastolic dysfunction. He looked at actually a, a, about 160 preterm infants in the first kind of two to three days of age and found that those infants who were on invasive ventilation and those infants that had higher rates of pulmonary hem hemorrhage had much worse diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle, really highlighting kind of that LV diastolic dysfunction, the blood backs up, left ventricle, left atrium, into the pulmonary veins, into the lungs, and causes worsening of their pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary disease physiology. And when you kind of tie this all together, as I mentioned, it really goes into the coupling mechanisms where as RV afterload goes up, you could also have an impact where initially the RV performance is preserved, it's very high in stage two, and then it fails as you go into stage three. And the coupling phenomenon, again, there are measures that can give you a direct assessment of coupling. When Reagan and her group looked at this, based on her adverse versus normal outcome, she actually found, which was fascinating, that during the cooling period, the kids who had worse outcomes had lower measures of coupling. So the heart was not able to augment itself with the rising evidence of afterload. So there's both a primary and secondary impact. So this is just another way to take quantitative measures to give you insight into mechanism. I put this on the, on the, on the screen because it's a real tribute uh, to the work that, that Reagan had done several years ago, looking at the insult, hypothermia, and rewarming. And this slide is meant to make your mind go dizzy because there are so many factors that are going on the screen. So when you're choosing your therapeutic interventions, you have to be conscientious of contractility, of preload, of afterload, 
What's the impact of the vascular tone? How much hypoxia and acidosis can this baby tolerate? And please, please, please do not forget the impact on the cerebral blood flow, CNS redistribution, and how does this all relate to both the short-term and long-term outcomes? So I like this picture. Patrick put it on the screen several years ago to understand the impact. So you have elevated PVR, elevated afterload from HIE. You can have decreased LV function from the HIE. I gave some other examples. You can have altered RV function from the HIE. You can have increased LV afterload from the acidosis and the impact on SVR. It can impact pulmonary blood flow and the right atrium. It can decrease LA filling with pulmonary hypertension. This can all lead to kind of a right to left physiology. And the reason I put this on the screen today is that the treatment for each of these are slightly nuanced and slightly different and can each impact the different parts of the physiology you see on the screen. So the issue here is that cardiovascular dysfunction in one study was shown to occur in about 62% of the time and was often defined as just a requirement for cardiotropic medication. The issue is that the treatment with inotropes is so highly variable across clinical trials by different groups, making it really hard to come to a complete consensus. I highlight this work from, from Patrick that came out last year, really looking at dopamine. And for me, the take-home point is that, yes, it is the most commonly used medication for hypotension, and yes, it can increase the blood pressure, but it also has increased risk of composite death or abnormal MRIs, and it also has severe impact on the pulmonary vasculature in high doses. So you have to be very careful with the use of dopamine. I, I personally don't use it, especially in this patient population. I'm going to skip this slide. I, I want to talk just about milrinone for a second. I get a lot of these questions with all the work that we do, but it's important to understand what milrinone does. It works in the cardiac muscle cells by blocking the phosphodiesterase 3 receptors, increases contractility, helps with stroke volume. It also works in the smooth muscle cells by blocking the phosphodiesterase 3 and leads to vasodilation or afterload reduction, both in the pulmonary system and in the systemic circulation. And if you go back and you look at all of the, all the literature, we know its effect on reducing OI, helping the FiO2, there's a documented impact on LV and RV function, both with CDH, post-cardiac surgery, and acute pulmonary hypertension. But what about in the HIE population? What's going on? We know that in the immature neonate, the preterm infant who have less L-type channels and less T-tubules, we know that there is going to be a less impactful result when you give milrinone, but also in different disease states like hypothermia, like cooling, where you may have an immature sarcoplasmic reticulum. So giving a drug that has an impact on calcium and sarcoplasmic reticulum in a state where that may be abnormal may not be advantageous. So in work, again, done by Reagan and Patrick and Adrian and Afif, it was a really nice study where they almost had like two controls. So you can see in red, you have HIE, acute pulmonary hypertension who got milrinone during therapeutic hypothermia, and then just straight up pulmonary hypertension who got milrinone, and then HIE, pulmonary hypertension, and no milrinone. And what you can clearly see is that the diastolic blood pressure is significantly lower in the children who got the milrinone. So this risk benefit of giving milrinone to potentially help with contractility may have adverse impact on these babies' blood pressures because you have an abnormal sarcoplasmic reticulum or you're not able to excrete it properly and you have to be very cautious with this medication. So question 15, and this is really going to take us home over the last 10 minutes. Hypoxic respiratory failure, acute pulmonary hypertension, and you have parenchymal disease. Assume that your, your function of the heart is okay. So, so what would you do first? Would you give a selective pulmonary vasodilator? Would you just give milrinone? Would you give a fluid bolus? Would you give surfactant? So let's just say you may have a little low blood pressure, but the function of the heart is probably okay. What are you gonna start with? So let's see what everyone chose. 
great. 70% of you chose kind of that selective pulmonary vasodilator, and that's what we would do as well. Take-home is very cautious with milrinone. Let's go to the next question. Impaired systemic hemodynamics, hypotension, but it's isolated systolic hypotension. What would be your first line medication? I, I didn't really speak about this, but when I think about systole and diastole, I think systole reflects contractility or function and diastole reflects afterload. So if your diastolic blood pressure is low, then your afterload is going to be low. And if your systolic blood pressure is low, it's going to impact the contractility or the function. So based on that, what would you do first? A lot of you, dobutamine, epinephrine. Okay, so basically you want to pick a drug that's going to impact your contractility. You don't want to just pick a drug that is going to impact, for example, your norepinephrine or your vasopressin that has no kind of inotropic properties because you're just going to end up increasing your SVR against the heart that can't pump out. So dobutamine and epinephrine were the correct answers. Be a little cautious with epinephrine because of its impact on lactic acidosis and hyperglycemia with the babies that are being cooled. What if you have normal function? What medication would you pick? So you don't really need something to augment your inotropes. You may then pick something that may just increase your SVR. So again, which medication? You know, milrinone, dobutamine, epinephrine, and dopamine all help with inotropy, norepinephrine, and S, uh, will help raise your SVR. Vasopressin will raise your SVR and lower your PVR. So let's see what everybody kind of chose. And the answer was vasopressin. That that could be uh, uh, the right choice. Nor epinephrine is definitely a good choice. I'd be very cautious with the epi and the dopamine and the milrinone just because you don't really need that contractility property. We'll get to hydrocortisone in a minute. So vasopressin and norepinephrine are the right choices. Again, these are questions that that Reagan proposed. What about refractory hypotension? You've, you've tried the preload. So let's see what that question is. You've maybe, you've tried an inotrope. So what would everybody choose here? I, I mean, basically giving it away. So basically when you get to the point where you have refractory hypotension and nothing seems to be working, could you potentially have an insult on the adrenal glands? And the answer is probably yes. And I hopefully about 84% of you correctly chose hydrocortisone. And then I think the last one, if you have severe RV dysfunction, so with severe RV dysfunction, what should you consider with acute pulmonary hypertension? So something that's going to impact the contractility of that right ventricle. Um, again, you want to look for something with kind of inotropic properties, and let's see what everybody's choosing. Um, again, you don't want to just pick something that's going to raise your SVR. So people pose, oops, I closed that too early, sorry. So epinephrine, a fluid bolus to impact preload, and then prostaglandins, as I mentioned, if you need that PDA in order to supply your systemic circulation. And we'll, we'll skip the final question because of time, but if you have severe LV disease and normal function, that's very rare. That's when you think of a coronary issue or severe myocarditis. So just so you know, if you have an echo and there's severe RV function, but the RV is preserved, start to look in detail at coronaries, get your cardiologist involved. So here, here's kind of the last slide, cardiotropic therapies, and I put a QR code up there. I, this is going to start to evolve over the years for you. For example, when I look at something like this, I think, oh, you know, what are my goals? What are my goals with pulmonary hypertension? I want to raise my SVR, lower my PVR, and optimize my heart function. But what if I start a medication and I don't see an impact? You need to have cutoff value. So if you are a center that uses the epi and you get to point one, that's my cutoff value, think about a second line agent. As you're thinking about a second line agent, think about stress dose steroids because it takes four to six to eight hours for them to kick in. If you're a dopamine center, have your cutoffs at five to seven, seven to 10 in order when you're going to go to your second line and go to your third line. And when I start to see this, I start to see patterns, epi, milrinone, dopamine, dobutamine. They really seem to impact contractility. What about norepi and vaso? No real effect on contractility, but they will raise your SVR. So again, this is not a drug you want to use if there's severe RV and LV dysfunction. 
What about melanone and dopamine? Those are afterload reducers and they impact contractility. So the point here, hydrocortisone would be your refractory. So with this table, I break it down into SVR, PVR, and contractility. There's no drug that does all three. I look at different effects. If your heart rates are really high, I might not want to use epinephrine. So this is a nice take-home slide. So I'm going to skip that. So the important questions to answer, what is the impact of HIE on therapeutic hypothermia? So there's a direct impact on LV and RV performance. How good are we at monitoring this? We're bringing the bedside hemodynamic tools from bench to bedside. And finally, yes, we should match the physiology to help us target our therapeutic interventions. And with that, um, I really want to be able to leave time. I know there's not that much time. Um, I want to highlight this article written by Danielle Rios, one of our uh, moderators, um, and, and Reagan. And again, I want to just thank everybody for the opportunity to present today, really just in honor of all of the work that's being done around the world, highlighting the work in Iowa, Toronto, Dublin, Australia, and other places. Thank you so much. So thanks so much. That was that was fantastic. As I'm talking, I'm going to share the uh, slide for uh, the fantastic talk. Um, we're very grateful for your presence. I would ask for everyone again, if you haven't had a moment to do so, please do use that QR code now. Please complete the evaluation. Uh, it will let us know whether to invite Phil next year six times or just one just one time during the year, uh, and it's very helpful to our ongoing. Uh, um, evaluation and uh, and tinkering. So I'd like to thank everyone, our seminar attendees, our trainees for joining. Um, I want to thank my co-host and moderator, Dr. Danielle Rios, of course, and Ms. Laura Thomas, who's the brains behind the operation. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone again next month and wishing everyone a happy uh, Easter and happy Passover. Bye, everyone.